chaplain. Veni Sancti Spiritus, Replitorum Corda Fidelium, et tui amoris in a signem accendi, qui per diversitatum linguarum cunctarum gentes in unitate fidei congregasti. Amen. Will you please be seated? I welcome all of you most warmly, and especially Archbishop, you and your wife. Now, this is the university's chapel, and although many of those present have been here before, a little revision will not hurt us. This university, like, <clears throat> like that of St. Andrews and Glasgow, is a papal foundation. The Pope was Alexander VI, who died in 1503, and following a petition by William Elphinstone on behalf of King James IV, the Pope issued a bull founding the university in 1494 and appointing William Elphinstone as the first chancellor. The purpose of the university was, quoting the bull, to praise the divine name, to rejoice in the Catholic faith for the salvation of souls and to advance the good order and the profit of the local area and of the nation itself. Now, Elphinstone <coughs> had been consecrated as the Bishop of Aberdeen in 1488. <coughs> His diocese was large, scattered, and in disarray. He completed building St. Macca's Cathedral in Old Aberdeen and he extended St. Nicholas Church in the nearby Royal Borough of Aberdeen, and he built the first stone bridge over the River Dee. He had been the Chancellor of Scotland and the Lord Privy Seal. Alphonston appointed our first principal, Hector Boyce, and Hector Boyce was a philosopher, he was an historian, and perhaps astonishingly, he was a friend of Erasmus, and he can be called a humanist scholar. His appointment <coughs> demonstrated how open the fledgling university was to the strands of new learning. Remember that Patrick Hamilton, who was burned to death in St. Andrews in 1528, was also an Erasmian scholar. Work began on this chapel on the 2nd of April, 1500, and that was consciously the day and the month on which Solomon began to build his temple and the chapel, remarkable then and now, was the apple of Elphinstone's eye. Its oak choir stalls are untouched, and they are now as they were in the days of Bishop Elphinstone. And Elphinstone, of course, is buried here in front of me, and Hector Boyce is buried just there, slightly to my left. So this is the heart of the ancient university. I have a number of loyalties to this city, as I was born here, and I came here to teach in 1993. I was and <clears throat> am 
proud that the Enlightenment philosopher Thomas Reed taught here, but my strongest emotional bond to the university is my admiration for John Forbes, a now largely forgotten 17th century professor of divinity. In 1638, many people in Scotland signed the National Covenant protesting liturgical reforms proposed by King Charles I. Anyone <clears throat> who thinks that fought crime and enforced consensus is new in Scotland shows how little they know of our history. They should read Walter Scott's novel, Old Mortality, a grim comedy aimed at obsessive thinking. The Covenanters took their document from place to place, inviting people to subscribe it. John Forbes, as leader of the so-called Aberdeen Doctors, declined to sign the National Covenant in 1639 as being contrary to their conscience. In 1640, John Forbes wrote, I am so careful of the public peace that whatsoever I can do for it, unhurting my conscience, I will heartily do it. But seeing for the present, I find not warrant in my conscience to subscribe the covenant in the way they require. I prayed you to think it more convenient not to require any more of me but a peaceable behavior. Now, 25 years ago, I taught John Forbes' doctrine. And in fact, I so admired him and his peaceful resistance to enforce consensus that back when I was a proper professor in the university, I used to try to stand in the right place in procession when we came into chapel so that I could sit in Forbes's seat, which <laughs> still has his name carved in oak at the back. And in fact, it's on that side of four along. <laughs> now, Archbishop, leadership is enormously difficult today, not least because the temptation is always to fall into lazy polarization. I can believe that the leadership of bishops is especially difficult. It is crucial not to succumb, but to listen, to persist, and to carry on arguing for what really matters. We admire your many attempts to form peaceable consensus. And we celebrate the fact that today you will join the ranks of the Aberdeen doctors. Now, the choir is going to perform a piece, and I'm going to say a word or two about it because it's an interesting and important piece. It will sing a setting of Locus Iste, which was composed by Paul Milo for the quincentenary of this chapel in 2005. And Paul Milo is actually here this morning, and he is the university's professor of composition. We are very proud of him, and his music was heard at the memorial services for the late Queen and at the coronation of King Charles one year ago. The words are taken from the Roman Catholic Mass for the dedication of a church, 
locus iste a deus factus est. This place was made by God a priceless sacrament beyond reproach, to which in a reference to the crown tower of the chapel just over there, there are two lines from the poet Peter Davidson. O oh, flawless hallow, O oh, seamless robe, lantern of stone unbroken.
Professor Greggs. Pro Chancellor, I have the honor of presenting to you for the award of the degree Doctor of Divinity Honoris Causa, the most reverend and right honorable Justin Portal Welby, his grace, the Lord Archbishop of Canterbury. Justin Welby needs little introduction. As Archbishop of Canterbury, primate of all England, and symbolic head of the worldwide Anglican Communion, he is perhaps the best known and most recognizable cleric in the British Isles. He is well known for his willingness to speak publicly in the media on issues that the nation faces and for his honesty and openness about his life and faith. Archbishop Justin was born in London. He was educated at Eton College and then Trinity College, Cambridge, from which he graduated with a degree in history and law, as well as the self-realization of personal faith. Albeit his future could not have been predicted since he reports being desperately embarrassed about this Christian turn in his life. Before feeling his call to ministry, a career fittingly for Aberdeen in the oil industry followed. During this time, Archbishop Justin married the wonderful Caroline Eaton, and they went on to have a large family. Tragedy, however, struck in 1983 with the loss of their seven-month-old daughter, Joanna, in a car crash. Typical of the Archbishop and of Lady Welby, their openness and honesty about this deeply sad event led them to establish a special day for bereaved parents during their time when Justin was canon of Coventry Cathedral. And he and Caroline have pastored and comforted many bereaved parents. Following his theological training and several parochial positions, the church was quick to identify the archbishop's leadership skills. Within a decade, he had been appointed a residential canon of Coventry Cathedral and the coordinator of the International Center for Reconciliation. Stories of his personal bravery through this time in some of the most difficult contexts in the world are remarkable and a testimony to the man of conviction and faith that he is. Prior to his consecration and appointment as Bishop of, Just of Durham, Archbishop Justin was appointed Dean of Liverpool Cathedral. As a Scouser myself, I can personally testify to his involvement in the realities of inner city life, as well as his intense work in making the cathedral a life-giving centre for the community. What I don't know, however, as an Evertonian, is whether he prayed sufficiently for the successes of the Blues during this time, <laughs> or whether his loyalties may have laid with another team that I could never mention in the presence of so holy a man. <laughs> Given our current performance, I think he didn't pray enough. <laughs> After only one year, as Bishop of Durham, Archbishop Welby was announced as the 105th Archbishop of Canterbury in a line which stretches back almost a millennium and a half. He has brought a truly global, energetic, ecumenical and wise approach to the role. There are too many aspects of his archiepiscopacy to list, but notable among these has been his capacity to address a range of issues which have hitherto eluded effective Christian comment. While everyone regrets poverty and many Christians have spoken and acted against it, Archbishop Welby has mobilized the Church of England, specifically against payday lenders and gambling machines. He brings an honest voice to the public square and has a strong record of being practical in working towards meaningful resolutions. Remarkable, perhaps for a church person, he has made particular contributions as a member of the Parliamentary Commission on Banking Standards. Within the life of the church, 
Archbishop Welby has managed to maintain unity within a global ecclesial communion, which has at times been very divided. His work in reconciliation and forgiveness in relation to victims of abuse has been honest and powerful. Furthermore, under his tenure, women have for the first time been able to be consecrated as bishops in the Church of England, in no small part due to his guidance, wisdom and vision. For those who might think that the work of the Archbishop is primarily in terms of strategic leadership, it is worth remembering that Archbishop Justin has, making very practical use of Lambeth Palace, established the ecumenical community of St Anselm, named after his famous forerunner for 20 to 35 year olds. This is a spiritual community dedicated to prayer, study and service of the poor. Furthermore, his commitment to ecumenism has been seen in his flourishing relationship with Pope Francis. Pro-Chancellor, for these and his many other contributions to the ministry of the church, to public theology, and to the service of Great Britain, I have the honor to present to you for the degree of Doctor of Divinity, Honoris Causa, the Archbishop of Canterbury, His Grace, the Most Reverend and Right Honorable Justin Portal Welby. Ego te sacrosanti theologiae, doctorem et magistrum, constituo creo proclama renuncio, et in signum capitum hoc pilio orno, quod ut felix vasdunque sit, deum optimum maximum praecor. The University of Aberdeen Chapel Choir will now sing a, another piece. They will perform Exultati Justi by Ludovico da Viedana. Thank you. 
Archbishop. First, uh, Mary Chancellor, may I thank you for this great honor and uh, the privilege of this degree, which I value enormously and feel greatly, greatly privileged to have been given. Um, and to Tom, um, and uh, who I've known for some years now, and uh, the other professor I've known here for quite a long time, or who was here is John Swinton, of course, uh, both of whom have helped me a great deal over the last 11 years. For as Archbishop, you will notice that in Tom's um, very misleading um, eulogy, um, uh, uh, there was no mention of academic qualifications. <laughs> and that is because if you look at the beginning of your program, um, uh, the second page of uh, the Pro-Chancellor's introduction, he says, originally King's College, this place was created as a place where, quotes, men who are rude and ignorant of letters, close quotes, could receive an education. Well, I qualify. <laughs> this university has been a place of teaching theology uh, since 1495. It, it has an extraordinary distinguished present as well as a lengthy past. One might say that it is almost in a golden age in its theology coming first in the recent research excellence framework. And yet theology across the universities of the United Kingdom is something that is under pressure. And there will be those here, as well as in other places, who say, why would one study about, as someone put it to me recently, in a calm, but shall we say robust manner, why should one study about the fairies at the bottom of the garden to whom you address meaningless words? I think he meant God. And the answer, I think, is, is found very briefly in the way in which theology is first about God, and the idea of God is still at the center of, about, of the lives of about 80% of our global population. And one cannot understand much of what is happening around the world without a study of theology, or at least basic theological literacy. And yet that is a purely pragmatic answer. Uh, there is also that theology enables us to explore the complexity of the mystery that in our culture and history has been understood as being God. That mystery which is revealed to us as Christians believe in Jesus Christ, but also a mystery which throughout history has led too often amongst Christians to easy polarization, but in a good theological faculty such as this enables that polarization to be challenged. Let us just say that at the moment that seems more important than ever. Because in our situation, which one of our leading generals described as equivalent to 1937 or 1938, Polarization is our greatest danger. For binary thinking is inherent to the idea of conflict and of war. The binary thinking that says victory or defeat are the two, only two options. Not finding a way the complicated, rubble-strewn, painful, 
walk towards reconciliation and peace. And for those in the front lines, and for those civilians caught amongst such conflicts, such as those in Rafa, or in the front lines in Ukraine, near Odessa especially, the ultimate binary, life and death. Theology expands our capacity to recognize that it's never that simple, that there are alternatives. And when well taught as here, when well thought as here, enables us also to explore and imagine new possibilities which the conflicts of our intensely conflictual world at the moment do not present to our minds as possibilities. May theology flourish. May this university flourish in its teaching of theology and in all that it does. May our society in these coming years find afresh the real alternative to radical autonomy and individualism, which is found in ideas of the common good, of the community, of compromise and the recognition of the struggles of others as real to them as ours are to us. Thank you again for this great honor. The chaplain. Would you all please stand with me as we close our time together? <coughs> May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind always be at your back. May the sun shine warmly upon your face, and may the rains fall softly on your fields. And until we meet again, may you be held in the palm of God's hands. Amen. Mm -hmm.